A man and a woman were given 13 and 6 years in jail, respectively, for their participation in a gang of Confederate flag enthusiasts who drove around a tiny Georgia hamlet in 2015, threatening individuals, including a gathering of African Americans who were celebrating a little boy's birthday. A few weeks before the incident, a white supremacist murdered nine black parishioners at a church in South Carolina, prompting a reaction against displays of the Confederate battle flag in public spaces. The crime was punished under the state's street gang terrorism legislation. Before the incident, the Georgian gang, known as Respect the Flag, was reportedly observed traveling in a convoy of vehicles carrying rebel flags and yelling threats towards black people. Jose Torres and Kayla Norton were the last of the gang to get a sentence. Prosecutors said they shouted racial epithets and threatened the birthday party goers with a firearm. In a courthouse in Douglas County, they sobbed as the judge handed down their sentences. That's not me. That's not him. I'm so sorry that that happened to you. Torres, 26, was sentenced to 13 years in prison and an additional seven years of probation for aggravated assault, making terroristic threats, and breaking the legislation against street gangs. Norton, 25, was sentenced to six years in prison and nine years of probation for making terroristic threats and breaking the law against street gangs. They were both expelled from Douglas County, a multiracial area a few miles west of Atlanta. In an interview, Douglas County District Attorney Brian Fortner said that the prosecution of the assault started with individuals who had less significant participation before moving inward toward those who were responsible for it. The other participants, roughly a dozen, either pled guilty to crimes or enrolled in pre-trial diversion programs, while two others got jail terms, according to Fortner. On the day of the assault, local police came under scrutiny for their decision not to detain any of the attackers. Fortner added that the Douglasville Police Department finally developed the case for prosecution. Thousands of Facebook accounts were examined as part of the inquiry, which revealed Respect the Flag members to be white supremacists who spoke of attending KKK gatherings, becoming a skinhead, and disparaging black people, Fortner said. Edgar Ray Killen, an elderly man in a wheelchair, inhaling through flimsy green tubes of an oxygen tank, symbolized Mississippi's violent, hate-filled history for many people in the Mississippi courtroom on June 21, 2005. It's the sense of this court that you served 20 years in the custody of the Mississippi Department of Corrections. On a remote road in the little timber town of Philadelphia, Mississippi, Three civil rights activists were killed 41 years ago today. The shocking act rocked the nation, sparking the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the 1988 film Mississippi Burning. And on that sweltering day, a fresh group of jurors found Edgar Ray Killen guilty of manslaughter in the murders of those three employees, whose names came to symbolize their brutality of the civil rights era. James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner. Killen, a former Ku Klux Klan leader and country preacher who ordered the murders out of hatred and bragged about them, was found guilty of the 1964 felony by the Neshoba County jury in under five and a half hours. Those outside the courtroom applauded. During the event, graying black men who grew up in a segregated world but lived to see it end, held their faces in their hands and sobbed in the audience, according to a story from the Washington Post at the time. As he exited the courtroom, Killen scowled and took a swipe at one of the cameras documenting his comeuppance. He was hunched over in his wheelchair. After being detained for speeding in 1964, the three civil rights activists were assaulted. Mike Hatcher, a former Philadelphia police officer and errand boy for the Klan, said in the 2005 trial that Killen boasted to him about the murders the day after they took place, the Post reported at the time. I understand how you feel, sir, Schwerner said just before he was shot and buried in a mud dam, Killen had informed Hatcher. Weeks passed before the remains were discovered and the murderers were never brought to justice. In 1967, 
Killen and 18 other people were charged by the federal government for violating the civil rights of the men since Mississippi authorities had declined to pursue murder prosecutions at the time and there was no federal murder law in place at the time as there is now. Killen and the two other defendants each obtained mistrial verdicts while seven were found guilty, nine were found not guilty. William Bryan, Gregory McMichael, and Travis McMichael shot and killed a 25-year-old black man who was running in a mostly white southern Georgia area almost two years ago. We know that Ahmad was targeted because he was a black runner in a community that thought his presence there was inappropriate. Wanda and Marcus still are devastated yes. because they're missing a mod. Yes. Cooper Jones attorney Lee Merritt said during an interview on GMA, Merritt remarked on the choice taken by the prosecution to focus their case more on the criminal nature than on race. He said, what I appreciated about the prosecution's strategy was that they said Ahmad Arbery was a citizen in the United States running on a free road and that alone entitled him to life, not because he belongs to any, you know, protected class. However, as citizens of the United States of America, we all have access to these rights. When they stop you, make sure you got your cameras on. Make sure you got a video. Malice murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Travis McMichael, guilty. Oh. A Glynn County jury found Travis McMichael guilty on all nine counts, including malice murder and four counts of felony murder. On Wednesday, McMichael shot Arbery to death in February 2020. Gregory McMichael, his father, was found guilty on all other charges, including four counts of felony murder, but was acquitted of the murder committed with malice. William Roddy Bryan, their neighbor who captured the event on a smartphone, was convicted of six offenses, including three counts of felony murder. All three men risk receiving a life sentence. After more than 11 hours of deliberations over two days, the 12-member jury, 11 white individuals and one black, revealed its decision. Oh, I want to first speak directly to my son, if I please. In the courtroom, Cooper Jones sobbed with relief. There are just not enough words to adequately express the range of emotions she was feeling at the moment. Cooper Jones said that she was relieved but wasn't too shocked by the decision. I sat there every day and listened to the state make its case. She said, I knew that if the jurors accepted that evidence, went back and mulled over the evidence that was provided, that we would achieve justice for Ahmad, and we did. I was very, very certain that they did a very excellent job of presenting their case. Cooper Jones was asked whether she had any advice for the three defendants. She said, I would simply tell them that their bad decisions have impacted two families, my family and again, their family. She said that in addition to losing a son, the McMichaels also lost a grandpa and his grandson will have an effect on them. They lost three generations there, but I lost a son. Give all three defendants who are responsible for the death of my son the maximum punishment in this court, which I do believe is life behind bars without the possible chance for parole. Thank you. Jeremy Christian, a self-described white supremacist, squeezed his way onto a crowded Green Line Max train that was traveling in the direction of Clackamas Town Center. When drunk, Jeremy Christian began yelling hate speech and discriminating words at two black teenage girls, one of whom was Muslim and wearing a hijab. What had been planned to be a regular drive quickly turned into a nightmare. According to witnesses who observed Christian continue to scream about beheading heads, the train operator even threatened to call the police if Christian didn't stop bringing outside individuals into the train, including Micah Fletcher and Talisa Miradin. Christian was yelling at the girls as Namkai Micha urged him to stop, but things rapidly got out of hand and Christian stabbed Fletcher. Christian was raving at the females while Namkai Micha was there. 
Matt Fletcher was taken to the hospital with a massive cut across his neck, while Namkai Micha was brutally put to death as a result of the events that transpired. Christian made an attempt to flee the train while still clutching the knife, but he was apprehended and later admitted that he was responsible for the stabbing. Christian made a statement that was taped when he was in the backseat of a police car in Portland. In the statement, Christian offered a short excuse for his behavior. He posed the following rhetorical question, think I stab a**ers in the neck for fun? Oh, you are quite right. I do think that. A patriot? I am. Everyone in Portland was left in a state of disbelief after the occurrence, and many people questioned how anything of this kind could have taken place. Micah Fletcher, who was a student at Portland State University at the time of the assault, was one of the victims who spoke about how Portland is supposed to be a place where people can feel secure. I hate the fact that I am essentially saying something that makes it sound like I have an iota of shit to give for the man that essentially ruined my life. But I only say these things because I want shit like this to never happen again. Micah Fletcher was a victim of the attack. Since I do not believe that I was able to be there, please accept my sincere apology on behalf of my family. Due to the fact that I've been putting so much effort into getting well, I haven't been able to visit my actual home for the last three years. According to him, he still has dreams about Christian continuing to curse and threatening to kill a relative of the dead who made a victim impact statement on the day of the attack during the trial. This relative provided a statement about the effect the assault had on the victim on the day of the assault. His outburst forced the court to remove him after he was found guilty of 12 counts, including first-degree murder, assault, and hate crimes. He was then sentenced to two consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole, in addition to 25 years for subsequent offenses. Christian made an effort to justify his wrongdoings and did not exhibit any sorrow for his actions. As always, thank you for watching. Please remember to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and stay tuned for more content.